Oh, got some mail. Let's see what we've got. Oh. oh, it's fragile. There'll be links down below for these things if they're not broken. Look, we've got a plastic bag, a bubble wrap bag, and then another plastic bag. And we've got some bobs. So the bubble wrap's good, but why do they have to be in three layers of plastic bag? That's just ridiculous. These are some little bulbs. I'm not sure what the naming is on these. Does it say this? This is 24 volt, 1.2 watt. And this one, 12 volt, there we go. 12 volt, 1.2 watt. So these are little plug-in bulbs. These are used for like instrument clusters, things like that on vehicles, that kind of thing. And I know I've got some bulbs out in the motorhome there in the dashboard, which I have been meaning to get around to doing. Now I did those previously. I think I did buy bulbs for that locally, but they were expensive yeah so i've got some more these ones are from aliexpress it's just dashboard lighting it's not particularly exciting so 12 volts 24 volts i've got both types here it's a mechanic uv queuing light now i saw someone using one of these was it paul daniels was using it the macbook repair guy not the magician i don't know if you watched my videos never come to my videos i think maybe once he was using a unit like this this is rechargeable there's a USB-C port up here. Cheapskates didn't give me a cable, but <laughs> that's fine. So it's a UV cooling light. So if you're doing like things like UV solder mask and things like that, you can just put this over it and set it up and walk away and leave it going. Instead of having to hold a torch over it, like which is, you know, you've probably seen me do that numerous times before using UV solder mask. You know, you stick there with a UV torch on it for, you know, a minute or two curing it, which is a bit boring. Yep, it's charged up. There you go. Don't look into it. I'm just joking, obviously. You can't get UV through a camera. <clears throat> anyway, should we try it? Let's try it. So here I've got one of these UV test cards. I've got a bunch of these. Let's turn it on, see what lights up. Leave it on there for a short time. There we go. Obviously, it is UV because it's showing up as UV. Brilliant, that's actually a real thing. I didn't doubt that, really. So this is the yellow one that I use. Let's put this on something and we'll briefly try it out and see how long it takes. So I've put some solder mask on my RAM knife here. And it's got delay time stuff on it as well. So just to stick this over it. I don't know how to use this yet. Delay, no, I turn it on first. Then we've got delay. How do we do the delays? That says about 30 seconds there. So we'll leave it on for 30 seconds. And we'll see if that does enough. It should turn off after 30 seconds, I believe. And then we'll give it a poke and see if it's actually um, cured. Depends on the strength of the actual UV emitter and that sort of stuff as well. How long it actually takes. That's counting down. There we go, it's gone out. UV has gone out. Is it hard yet? No, but it is skinning. That bit there's gone, just about. Because this is quite thick here. And that's also quite thick, so it is doing it, kind of. That's still watery there, that's still watery there because it's outside the sides there. So it's a nice little test of the breadth of the beam. So just here is actually where it's in the centre. It's actually quite good, that's actually hard there, it's quite thin. It's just about done. So. 30 seconds is a bit short, that's not surprising. Everyone likes it to last more than 30 seconds, apparently. Definitely! Well, I've had this thing going for a bit now, and where it's really thin, it's worked just fine. But where it's quite thick, it's actually still not really gone. And it's been on there for probably two minutes now. So that bit there's alright. But this is still a bit soft in here, and that's still soft there. It has skinned, but there's still wet there. Where it's, just, it's really focused UV, I think. If it's right in the middle of the beam, it works well. If it's off to one side, not so much. So, yes, it works, but it may not be best for all situations. I think my UV torch actually does a better job, to be honest. I mean, this is okay if you're doing, you know, looking at it and stuff, but, yeah, I think it needs a bit more. And if you want to put it down and walk away so you don't get exposed to UV, sure, but um, my torch does better. So I actually left this thing on for a small duration there because I actually went out to go cut the grass before it started raining. I barely made it. I actually left it on. On top of here, I came back, so it's like half an hour or so. It was still soft over here, it wasn't actually cured on there for half an hour, still hadn't done it. So I got my UV torch out, stuck it on there, did it in 30 seconds. Yeah, I mean, it was kind of done, but I think if it's maybe it's this color, doesn't like this particular color because it doesn't go off very well. So I don't know. I mean, the color of this UV bulb obviously is UV, but it's a, like if you shine it on something, you can see this is a stronger blue, I suppose, and my UV torch is a lighter blue. This is darker blue, I suppose, and what you can see on what is shining on an object. I'm not convinced about it, actually, to be honest. I mean, it obviously does something. It did do some of it, 
but I don't think it's as good as my UV torch. Your results may vary. Maybe a different brand would work better. I don't know. Mini DC UPS. So I bought a couple of different versions of UPS. I wasn't quite sure which one's going to be the best for the situation. This one's half the size of the other one. Probably means much less battery capacity for a start. I mean, the other one's meant for mains powered situation. It actually is a UPS. You put up mains and you can supply some 12 volt equipment with it. If the mains drops out, it switches the battery and carries on, right? Look at all UPS. This one is based on a low voltage system. Just these ports here. So input is 5 to 12 volts coming in and we've got all these outputs on the back. So we've got 5, 9, 12, 15 and 24 volt. I'm not sure if the 5 volts are high enough current for what I want. Yeah, there's the details on the back there. So 5 volts, 1.5 amps and 1.5 amps. Whether they're shared, I'm not sure. 9 volt, 1 amp, 12 volt, 1.5, 15 volt, 1.2, 24 volt, 0.75. But the idea of this is you can run it from low voltage instead and actually um, input 5 to 12 volts. So it's also you're doing a buck boost kind of situation there, or boost buck, I should say. And I'm actually thinking about jamming a dual, like redundant power supply system. So you've got the UPS way of doing it. But if there's UPS failure, you're still stuffed. But, or if you get to turn it off, or you push a button on it, a mistake or something like that, where you actually yank a cable out, you lose power. So what I'm thinking about is, that's one option. But the other option I'm thinking, is actually having dual redundant power supplies. So you've got two supplies, two UPS based supplies, like this and the other one I've already purchased and then having an automatic changeover. So if one dies, it switches over to the other one. So it's like fully redundant, redundant, if you know what I mean. Double redundant. Anyway, it comes with some cables. It's got a splitter cable here and a adapter. Is that 2.5 to two? I think it is, or 2.1. Pop the top off. There we go. That's what's in there. Little basic buck boost converter sort of setup. Nothing particularly special. Protection is not really Obvious, don't see any PDCs, which would be nice to see, but I don't think they're in there. And natural cells ICR 18650. Now, I think ICR are the less safe version of them. I think INR is the better one. The ICRs are less safe. I think these ones are a bit more volatile. Anyway, 2600 milliamp hours, so that's all right. I was just telling you about this. So, these are some changeover things. Change over relays. So you have battery supply, DC supply coming in here, and you have an output. So this is actually what I was talking about just now with the changeover. So DC supply here, battery supply here, and then output. So if the DC supply drops off, it will drop over the battery. In this case, battery, it's just two different inputs. They call it battery because that's what the assumed usage is going to be. Regulator circuit built into it, which is interesting. I'm guessing that's running just purely for the relay control, the sense of voltage and can switch the relay on and off. Um, I don't know what voltage this is rated for. 12 volt relay, zero up rails shared between all three, so you only actually need a positive of each one, and you can share the negative. I've got a few of those because I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do with these, and I like to have spares always. And I think I've I've got different sources I need to switch as well, like five volt source, 12 volt source. So I need definitely two of them, and it gives you one spare. But uh, you always need spares. So this could be what I use for that system I was telling you about just now. Ooh, I've set up a test. I've set the board up here. Let's probe onto it. Turn the power supply on. I've got two power supplies going to this for my dual rail power supply. So rail one, which is like marked as the main DC in, that's the DC in, and this is the battery supply. So we can see which one's actually coming as the main. We've got this one here, which is on the DC input. Now, when I pull the plug, this will switch over, hopefully, and go to the battery supply. So the secondary set of terminals. So this is the primary set of terminals. This is the secondary ones, you can see it's got an LED on here as well. So it's obviously working. I'm trying 12 volts. I don't know what voltage this will work on. Maybe I should check. Uh, okay, so let's pull the power out of that one. That's dropped out. It's now changed over. It says 12.5 now, which is from the secondary supply, which is this one here. So that's the 12.5 supply, that's 12.3, and that's switching over nicely. I'm not sure if there's much of a changeover delay. It's possible, isn't it? This is still a manual range on that. You does see it drop down, so when it's turning on, it's almost instant. But when it's turning off, the relay, when it's relaxing, I think it's got a capacitor across it, which might be causing the relay to gradually change off. So turning on is quick, turning off is a bit slower. 
which isn't unusual. Relays sometimes will react differently in each direction. As the capacitor discharges, then the relay gradually turns off. Okay, so if I pull the other supply instead, the battery supply, there's nothing happening there as expected. And obviously when I pull that, it's going to die completely. So that works as expected. Nice enough. I'm just trying to trace around and figure out where the supplies are going. So that main input comes in, there's a diode there, which tells you polarity protection. And there's a big capacitor here, which is here. That's that, 11.5 volts. So that is across this main DC input here. And that's also then powering the circuitry. When this capacitor discharges, it'll be slowing down the rest of the circuit. Now we've got the coil here, that's a coil connection, running at 10.8 volts. And if I pull this, you see it gradually drops. Comes on quick, gradually drops down. See, it's a slow response. So that's that capacitor there discharging. And we've got this other capacitor over here, what's that doing? 10.8. So that's what I'm doing a relay coil. So there's a capacitor here, which is doing a relay coil. And then you've got that big supply cap there. So between the two of them, it's causing the relay to be slower to turn off, which is not really what you want. When you've got a supply like this, you want it to change over quickly. You don't want it to be slow, you want it to be a quick changeover. So you don't cause a dropout or, or a little brownout on your device. So I'm actually wondering if I should modify this circuitry a little bit. So I've had a close look at this, and I'll use this as a pointer. So the chip, this leg here, the chip comes out, goes to this coil. The other side of this coil comes through, and it's got some components down here. This positive cap here goes to this cap, that side there, that side there, and that resistor. So it goes on the coil around that resistor, that's not part of it. it goes around there, little track comes down here and then goes to that capacitor and obviously over to the relay somehow. I can't quite see where that trace is but it's obviously a connection between these. So this chip is obviously outputting that 12 volts or so to run this relay. Now I don't know if that voltage is going to increase or not if I increase the input voltage, let's try that. But that is running from the main supply not the battery supply. So if I measure on that capacitor there, increase the supply voltage, so let's increase this a little bit. Yeah, there we go, it is coming up a little bit. Still going up, still going up. I'm doing 14 volts now. That's now 12 and a half volts. Look at that, it's, yeah, 12.6. So maybe this is more of a 24 volt system thing, because that's now stabilized at that level there. So if I bring this down again slowly, there. That voltage there is 14.1 volts. That's where that voltage in tops out. You can see it ramping down. So yeah, that's still there. I think it may be having a high voltage coming in, might make it ramp down quicker, but no, it doesn't. Right, that's that side there. So it's interesting that voltage needs to be basically 14.2 volts to switch nicely. Below that, it's actually a bit underpowered. I might have to double check this, see if it's a 24 volt system or 12 volt system. Let's go down to five volts. That's shut off. Nine volts where it turned on. Right, so it needs at least nine volts to even turn on. So not suitable for 5 volt system, but 12 volt will work. And here we are, 7.5, that's what is required to turn this relay on. I mean, if they used the 5 volt relay, they could have done this as a 5 volt system. Shall I try shoving 24 volts into it? I've got two more. Should we see if it blows up? Let's do it. Let's, let's see if it goes bang. 24 volts coming in. Still got 12.68 there. Over here we have 24, as expected. Shove that in there. Now if I pull that one, it will change to the 12 volts. Here we go. And back again. Right, well, it runs a 24 volt as well. That's great. Should I push it up to 30? 29? 31? There you go. So, yeah, okay, we're on a 12 volts and 24 volts. But yeah, that relay turn off delay is a little bit less than ideal, I suppose you could say. I think it's a combination of these capacitors. I'll talk about it now, actually. So this capacitor here is just a big bulk cap off the main supply. So the supply comes in, goes through this diode, we've got a resistor here for the LED, for the indicator, goes across this big bulk cap here. Now, what voltage is this cap actually? That's a 100 volt cap. Nice. I was if it was a 16 volt cap, I could have blown it up. That could have been interesting. And it would have scared the hell out of my wife who was sitting behind me. Would have, yes. Then that comes across to this chip, this front leg on the chip there, that pin number one, it goes to that. So that's powering that chip. Then we've got a diode here of some kind. I'm not quite sure what that is. SS110. I think it's a shocky diode of some kind. And that appears to be across the output. It's probably another reverse polarity thing on across the output itself to protect it. Then you've got this cap here. So this cap is on the relay coil. 
Right, so this is obviously doing a buck regulator function, not boost, only buck, which is why it's working okay above a certain voltage at 14.1. So that's obviously a buck regulator section, and that's a smoothing cap for that, along with these two here to help get rid of the spikes. Not like it really matters that much, but that's what it's doing because it's obviously independent of the main supply. So this will power the chip and run through to here, and this will go through relay contacts, obviously. All right, so supply in is this one. And there's supply out there, so that's the common. That's normally open, and that's normally closed. Right, so you can see the normally closed comes through that one if it's powered off, and this one comes through if it's powered on. Simple enough, and it's obviously tacked off to do the regular section there and control the relay. And like I said, this capacitor here will be the storage cap for the buck regulator and to power the relay. I would have preferred to see more decisive switching. It's not wonderful switching. I mean, maybe a way to do that is to actually put another load across this capacitor, put a resistor across it to add some loading so this capacitor will discharge faster. That will still function fine. We'll load on the circuit and maybe make it work a bit harder, but it will get this cat to discharge faster and get the relay to turn off faster. That's a simple modification. Another way is to actually try to tune this cap value. So the current cap, 105 degree rated at least, uh, what is volt and microfarad. Actually. There is drop that down to maybe 100 microfarad, just half it, and see the circuit still stable with that capacitance value. You maybe it go down to 47 microfarad even. As long as this is still smoothed out to generate the 12 volt rail, it doesn't really matter. And having a smaller cap here will make this relay respond faster. Fragile box number one. It won't be broken, will it? Of course, it won't be broken. I mean, it's only a box of paper after all. <laughs> And that's what's in it. Not even an invoice in there, no invoice. Oh. So there we go, some CR2032 batteries and some end loops, triple A's. So I've got some AA's, which I've purchased, and I'm using those for various projects and bits and pieces where you just want to take them out and recharge them. I need some triple A's, because I thought I actually bought some, but I can't find them, so I bought some triple A's. Next few box. Oh, there's an invoice in this one. Got some more paper, and some cables. Cloverleaf cables, like this sort of thing. All right. I actually thought I had some of these. Turns out I didn't. I need one, but as you know, I like test beers. You never know what else I'm going to pick up, which might need one in the future. So at least I've got some here. They're cheap enough. It was actually cheaper to get these locally with shipping than it was to buy them from AliExpress. Weirdest thing ever. Subscribe over there if you're not already subscribed. There's other videos down here you can watch on the screen, and also down in the description you've got playlists and things you can watch. Repair videos, that kind of thing. Test gear, reviews, and whatever. I don't know. All sorts of stuff. I've done, I think it's like 1200 videos I've done now, something like that. There's also a Patreon support link over there. If you want to help support the channel, help me to buy a bit of test gear to fix and do videos about. Go check that out. Hey. I've got this fragile box here. Oops. I'm trying to record video, be quiet. <sighs> Oops. Oops. Everyone likes it last more than 30 seconds, apparently. Here's your cue. Oh, what? Sorry, I wasn't mm. listening. Oh dear. I, I was still sniggering over, is it hard yet? I say everyone likes it last more than 30 seconds. Definitely. Might be slightly louder. <laughs> louder for those in the back. <laughs> Definitely.